<clears throat> Thank you. Well, I'm going to lead you away from the skin to the liver and talk about the drug-induced liver injury network and a little bit about Stevens-Johnson syndrome that we've seen there. So drug-induced liver injury accounts for about 3 to 10 percent of acute jaundice liver injury that presents to physicians in the United States. It's the single major cause of acute liver failure in the U.S. and most of the Western world. It's a common cause for a medication to uh, be abandoned during development and a common cause for a medication to be withdrawn or restricted after it's approved. It used to be number one, now I think it's number two. And it, liver injury frequently accompanies Stevens-Johnson syndrome. Of course, it's usually not a very major problem and the skin problem is somewhat overwhelming in the clinical presentation, but it, it's often there. Here's a uh, network that we've been running for <clears throat> almost 20 years of acute liver failure in the United States. They've accumulated 2,000 cases, and this is the etiology. The, the number one cause, the cause of about 50% of cases is acetaminophen, Tylenol, usually an overdose. Sometimes it's a um, <clears throat> unintentional overdose. The second most known cause are drugs, and that's not one drug, it's not acetaminophen, but it's many drugs. And the other causes are shown there. Hepatitis B, for instance, is disappearing as a cause of acute liver failure in America, and hepatitis A is almost gone because of advances in those diseases. Over on the side are indeterminates, <clears throat> where you don't know the cause. It's the real challenge that we have. But drugs is, are an important cause. <clears throat> When we talk about drug-induced liver injury, they usually fall into two categories. One is a direct toxin, and the other is, um, it's not really indirect, it's idiosyncratic. The direct toxin means that the drug is intrinsically toxic. Injury is frequent, it's uh, dose-related, it comes with high doses of the drug, it's reproducible in animal models, it's expected. <clears throat> so um, that's acetaminophen, basically, there. But the, the more challenging group uh, here are the, those that are idiosyncratic, where you have a drug that's not intrinsically toxic. Uh, it causes liver injury, but the liver injury is rare, maybe one in a thousand people or one in ten thousand, maybe one in a million. It's not particularly dose-related. It's a little bit dose-related. You have to take enough of the drug. It's not reproducible in animals. It's unexpected, and of course, there's the challenge, because how do you study something like this from a research point of view when it's so uncommon? So idiosyncratic is unexpected. Here's isoniazid, the, <clears throat> the most common cause of fatal uh, injury from a drug. It causes hepatitis in about one in 500 people. The most common cause of jaundice from drugs is amoxicillin clavulanic acid. It's estimated about 1 in 2,000, 1 in 3,000. And diclofenac, a very important cause, is 1 in 30,000. It's quite unusual. The idiosyncrasity, we, we talk about it, idiosyncratic, it can be, we think here, of course, hypersensitivity, immunologic, but it may be metabolic or it may be a combination of the two. It presents usually as an acute hepatitis. It can be hepatocellular or it can be cholestatic or in between. Its etiology is generally unknown. <laughs> <clears throat> but one form of this is what we, what we call uh, immunoallergic hepatitis. It's our, our name for a drug hypersensitivity reaction that affects the liver. It usually occurs with rash or fever or one of the, these signs, uh, typically with a short latency. The rash and fever may precede the liver manifestations, and the injury is typical hepatocellular, like viral hepatitis initially, but then can evolve into a cholestatic picture. And it has many names, the syndrome. I've heard many of them today. You can have hepatitis with a simple rash, immunoallergic hepatitis, drug-induced hypersensitivity syndrome, which is probably a better name. The neurologists use the term anticonvulsant hypersensitivity syndrome. The dermatolo dermatologists use the term dress. <clears throat> And of course, the extreme forms are there. Now, what we found uh, about 
about 10 years ago, I was asked to look at the NIH portfolio in liver disease in general, and I gathered grants from all the institutes and looked at them and put them in piles. You know, here's viral hepatitis, here's basic research, here's genetics. And one of the piles was drug-induced liver injury. And it was, uh, we had a sizable portfolio. But looking at the grants, they were virtually all in direct hepatotoxicity. We were not funding anything on this idiosyncratic form. This was... So what do you do when you have a gap in research? You do what you're doing today. You have a meeting. And here's the meeting that we held in 2000. I think you'll find a, uh, <coughs> a young um, Neil Scherer there somewhere. <coughs> <laughs> we brought together clinicians, basic researchers, and said, what do we need to address this issue of idiosyncratic liver injury? And they they came to the conclusion kind of what is what we need is a network that would collect cases that we can study. And so <clears throat> we created the Drug-Induced Liver Injury Network in 2003, and the dates are important because this is during the doubling of the NIH budget. You can't do this when your budget's flat, it's very, or it's very hard. But that offered a wonderful opportunity. <clears throat> My boss didn't think this was a good idea. He gave me three years of funding with the idea, if we don't show anything by three years, you're out. And uh, we squeezed it. It's now been going on a little, uh, we're in our 12th year, I think. It's a consortium of clinical centers. They've ranged a number from five to eight. Uh, a data coordinating center at Duke. A sample repository for the DNA and the serum and the urine and the cells. And a genetics core, which, which is also at Duke, <clears throat> Duke, North Carolina. And the aim of the network was to collect and fully characterize cases of clinically apparent drug-induced liver injury to allow for mechanistic studies into its etiology and its provincial, potential prevention and treatment, so forth and so on. Here's, <clears throat> here are the centers that have been involved, and it's, uh, we've gone through several recompetitions. They've been open, so we have new centers. These are the centers we have at present in black. There are six. If you, if you notice, the one in California, it's, it's floating out to sea. It's moving to the left there. <laughs> but um, and the ones in green are the former ones. Uh, the DCC is at Duke. It's been a great group. We have uh, all the experts in drug-induced liver disease have been involved. It's been very exciting. And here's the enrollment. We targeted to have two patients per center per month. And we've been right on target. <clears throat> we have a dip every time we recompete. So what we faced immediately was this problem, causality. How do you know the drug has caused the liver injury? Because drug-induced liver injury basically can mimic any kind of liver disease, viral hepatitis, for instance. What you usually need is a compatible history. You need to rule out viral hepatitis, uh, other causes of liver injury. Uh, imaging is important to make sure there's not biliary obstruction or a mass. And what's most important is that you're dealing with a known cause, a drug that's known to cause liver injury, and it has a compatible signature, clinical signature or phenotype. But that's not always possible. There are no specific tests to prove causality. So rely upon subjective determinations. We decided to use a five-point scale uh, in assessing causality, uh, one to five, definite, very likely, probable, possible, and unlikely. But what do those terms mean? We use them all the time. The FDA uses them, but what they mean. So what we tried to do was standardize them to give some objectivity to these subjective judgments. First of all, we use a percent. Definish, definite isn't 100 percent, but it's greater than 95 percent. And very likely is 75 to 95, probable 50 to 70, so forth and so on. Actually, uh, you know, our, our Justice Department, the law, law courts have been dealing with us for a long, long time, actually, you know. Is he guilty or is he not? Did he do it? And they have uh, these very nice legal descriptions that are helpful. Definite, it means beyond a reasonable doubt, and that's a high level of evidence, difficult. Very likely, clear and convincing, probable, the preponderance of the evidence is in favor. And if it's below that, it's not guilty, it's no. So that separates yes from no. Now, beyond a reasonable doubt, that's a tough level of evidence. And as you know, there have been famous law, law cases where a patient was declared not guilty. <clears throat> 
and it was because the level of evidence was so high. We don't have to do that here. We've had about 1,000 cases enrolled, and these were the, this is the first 1,000. Uh, 899 were adjudicated as in this area of yes. But they were caused by 250 different agents. So we're not dealing with an uncommon disease. We're dealing with 200 rare diseases. <clears throat> Prescription drugs were 84%, herbals and dietary supplements. The 10 most common accounted for a third of the cases due to drugs. And here are the most common, the 20 most common I could fit on the slide. And you can see that several of these have come up here as causes of Stevens-Johnson syndrome. <clears throat> uh, sulfonamides, phenytoin, lamotrigine, allopurinol. So they're there. And did we see Stevens-Johnson syndrome? Actually, supposedly we have nine cases. I have to say that the, the, this was, these were hepatologists making the diagnosis, not, <laughs> not uh, so they, and, and looking over the cases myself, I think two of them aren't quite Stevens-Johnson. One is uh, pretty bad, erythema multiforme, and one was dress. But uh, look at the most common causes here. Lamoctrogene is up here. Only one case of carbamazepine was fatal, though. And the overall fatality rate with this diagnosis was high. So it's bad. And only one of those four deaths was due to liver disease. The other were due to um, multi-organ failure due to the complications of, S of Stevens Johnson. Here are the SDS cases, SJS cases. Here's the, all of them. You can see, <clears throat> what do they look like? Are they different? Yes, they are different. They're younger, a little more likely to be women. But here's a very interesting thing, <clears throat> and that's the racial diversity that's very striking in the Stevens-Johnson syndrome cases, that a third were black. It's a small numbers. But in the, the whole population is more matches the population of the U.S. Short incubation period, uh, sick, high, high degree of fatality. With drug-induced liver disease, uh, the fatality is about 10%. <clears throat> uh, this has been shown by other groups. This is our group from the United States, Indianapolis. This is a group from in India. <laughs> um, and uh, you can see that Stevens-Johnson's was a more common cause in their series of drug-induced liver disease, but the clinical features were similar. Uh, different drugs, but those are drugs that are used more commonly in India. So lamoctrogene accounted for 12 of the 900 cases. Uh, looking at these, 11 of them had either dress, Stevens-Johnson syndrome, or hepatitis with rash. So this suggests to me that uh, dress is, is a, dress a, a milder form of Stevens-Johnson syndrome. It's caused by the same drugs. 25% African Americans, again with this drug as well. Latency is short, like with Stevens Johnson. So the spectrum of drug induced liver disease goes from acute liver failure, but below this are asymptomatic rise in serum enzymes. And the question is with the, drug, with the skin, drug and, uh, are all drug hypersensitivity syndromes, or what we're talking about really just the tip of the iceberg? And would study of this also be helpful? and reflect on it. It would give you more, more cases, certainly. So uh, the other thing I want to point out is the nine cases with Stevens-Johnson syndrome are awful exposed to multiple other agents. Uh, the average was five. And look at the ones that are the also. These are the concomitant drugs, not the ones that are accused. Many of them have also been associated with Stevens-Johnson syndrome. So the causality is a challenge. <clears throat> so the other thing that the, our initiative in drug-induced liver disease has done is developed a website on drug-induced liver injury called LiverTox. It's sponsored by NIDDK and the National Library of Medicine, in which you can go to this website. There's no ads. There's no price. You don't have to register, and you can look up a drug. I look up background of drug-induced liver disease uh, for its association with liver disease. We include all drugs that cause liver injury. We include drugs that don't cause liver injury. Sometimes the negatives are, are, um, are striking. And uh, uh, this is the design of it. Each drug section has an overview, uh, has representative cases. There's about 1,000 cases on the website. 
have liver histology in a few, we're adding that now, the chemical structure, a link to the product label, and annotated uh, references. Here's to Clofenac, uh, a case report. Also, people can submit case reports to liver tox. And when they're submitted, you can search and find them from this, like the Clofenac thing. We'll search and find the, any cases of Diclofenac that are in our thousand, or it's actually 500 now in this from the outside. Eventually, all of the cases from Dillon will be enrolled in, in this so that you can look at them yourself. References, there's uh, the status now of liver tox. It has been released about two and a half years ago. We have about 100,000 100, unique visitors per month. We have 780 agents described. It's over a million words, 13,000 animated references, and 1,000 cases. So something to think about as a format to looking at a network and bringing attention to an, an area of a serious drug abuse, a serious drug adverse reaction. Thank you. Thank you. The floor is open for question. How are you? You made a comment yesterday uh, that we need to stay focused on and not, not do all adverse drug reactions. There's some clear uh, commonality or, or whatever the, the, the even bigger sense of the word is um, between what you just talked about. Um, I don't know whether the same is true with, with kidney disease or others, but where would you think the line should be drawn in terms of, of a, a network going forward that includes what, what you're doing but, uh, but also has some clear demarcation lines? Well, the problem is it requires uh, the uh, scientific expertise. And so uh, I... I couldn't add skin problems here because I'm, I'm not an expert. I'd have to get Neil. I have to be on the phone with Neil every day. So it does require a lot of input from someone who can uh, dedicate themselves to this. I guess the issue, you know, people have called me, why don't you do lung, lung problems and kidney injury and so forth? And I, I just, I don't have that expertise. With all these drugs, it's very difficult. And some of the most difficult things is to talk about drugs that don't cause liver injury, because you have to search, search the literature, and it's not easy to search when you're looking for a negative. But I think your, your, your point, as well as some of the, of the others, including from the advocacy groups, really highlight that this is a sy systemic disease. Oh, yes. And you know, you're looking at the <clears throat> liver, someone else is looking at the skin, someone else looking at whatever else. Um, and you know, maybe we do need to be more cross-cutting than we have been, regardless of the way the NIH is currently designated. Uh -huh, right. Well, for instance, the mortality rate that we say of 10 percent, well, uh, that's not liver, all liver deaths. Those are other multi-symptom symptom deaths or uh, other problems that come along. Even complications of the, of the evaluation of the patient, unfortunately, sometimes is a cause of death. Last question. Well, thank you very much uh, for elucidating the Dili issues for us. Um, uh, it, it was very helpful for me to understand uh, your perception of Dili and dress, but I, I'm not sure if I got you right. Did you say that you think dress is a minor type of Stevens-Johnson, or did I get that wrong? <laughs> <laughs> Okay. <laughs> okay. So we are clear that dress is something completely different than SJSTN, and I'm happy. <laughs> Thank you. Well, they're caused by the same drugs. I don't know. I have to ask. I, this is what the question I asked Neil, actually. That is true. They are caused by a number of drugs that are the same, allopurinol and carbamazepine, the most frequent ones we found in DRESS. I didn't right. talk about it because well, this was not a DRESS workshop. But I think in terms of clinical uh, definition and disease entity, uh, it's different conditions. Right. So the question is, are there drugs that cause DRESS that do not cause Stevens-Johnson syndrome? And that's what I'm talking about. When you're looking for a negative, it's sometimes very hard. To do. And as the FDA said, they have these warnings, <clears throat> but they can't put out a statement that says, this drug doesn't cause prolongation of the QT interval. And that sometimes would be helpful to say that, no, this doesn't cause it, or this doesn't cause drug-drug interactions. Uh, and it's, it's uh, difficult. <clears throat>
or you can also say, I don't know, which uh, we don't like to say sometimes. <clears throat> Thank you. Because of time, we to move on. Um, so the last talk um, is given by Dave Finstra. Uh, he's a professor at the Department of Pharmacy, University of Washington. And he's going to talk about the health economics policy implementation and cost effectiveness research.